Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Hired the Podcast. This week I sit down with Denise Kladzinski from Miller Resource Group and we do a deep, deep dive into what companies should really, really look for when they're hiring. I'll give you a hint, not much if it's on a resume. Uh, and then we talk a lot about what individuals can do to set themselves apart when they're looking for a job, when they find a company that they're passionate about, what can they do uh, on their resume, uh, in their social presence and within their network to land the job they want. And then we finish up talking a little bit about uh, her views and opinions on the current state and future of the food and beverage industry, which she is an expert in. And we talk a little bit about her company and what they've done differently to really, uh, really uh, do the best job possible of creating the best environment for their people. So without further ado, here we are. Let's take it away. Here I go, ready now. Coming for you, can't nothing stop me. I got some things I gotta do. Hey, 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 hey. I'm making a move. Study Denise, thanks so much for joining us here today. Really excited to talk to you. Can't wait to uh, hear your story, your views, your expertise on, on the world of work and what companies can do to really set themselves apart, what candidates can do to. Uh, really land the job that they're striving for, to hear a little bit about what you're seeing in your industry and, and frankly, any other interesting paths that we head down. So how are you doing today, Denise? I'm great. Thank you for asking, Travis. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. Thanks for taking the time to be here. Uh, so Denise, give us the 60-second rundown of who you are and, and what it is that you do. Mm -hmm. So executive recruiter, I specialize in food and beverage manufacturing, and I really zone in on helping companies find really good people to build upon the cultures that they're looking to find. Tell me a little bit about that. What can companies do to, um, to really build upon the culture that they're looking to find? Sure. You know, some of the things that I've seen my clients do to build, well, first of all, they need to be looking for a cultural compliment instead of a fit. I think often people go out looking for people who match exactly who they have on their teams. And I think that that's a short-sighted way to look at it. My really strong clients are looking for people who will complement the rest of their team. So what is the piece that they're missing? What's something that they need a little bit more of? And that's really when I find an individual who can shine within the company. If you have somebody who is, uh, you know, just doing more of the same of what you're already doing at the group, that doesn't bring anything new to the table. It's really when you actually get that person who complements your culture that you really can start building and growing the way that you should. That sounds like it'd be a lot harder because then you have to really go in and assess what you're missing, what you're bad at, or what you're, what you're not very good at, and then figure out how you can find people to, as you said, complement your culture instead of match your culture. What do you think some of the best ways to do that are? Well, you, you said it perfectly. It is more work up front. It's more work up front. You take the time, you spend it talking to your team, looking at what your shortcomings are, or just the areas that you'd like to be stronger in. You make that investment in your company up front, and then all of a sudden, you have a much clearer path on who and what you want to find later on. Or as you're going through the interview process, you have a much clearer view of, okay, does this person really bring what we're looking to the table? This is an area that when I'm talking to candidates that I'm coaching them on. You know, when they're talking to clients and and going through the interview process, I'm asking them, listen, every company is going to have things that, that are not, that are not perfect, right? Not, no company is perfect. No group is perfect. There's always going to be something that is not, that's missing something. The, the question is not whether they're missing something. The question is, is what they're missing your strength? Is it what you're bringing to the table? And is it what you can complement their company on? Because when you can do that, when you go somewhere where you really bring that what's missing, that's when you shine. That's when you as, a, as an individual are hitting your true potential. That's when people are giving you high fives in the office because they see and feel the difference with you being there. Talk to me a little bit more about what you mean by um, enhance the culture and really how a company can, can dig in 
when they are talking to candidates, how they can dig in to find out if somebody has that ability to, to enhance their company, to enhance their culture. Mm -hmm. So knowing your opportunities, right? So diving into what is it about my company, about the, um, the individuals who work on the, like if you're working with food manufacturing, like I do, who's on your floor, who makes up the team, what is it that they need or what's missing that can help them hit their true potential, right? So once you've identified that, then your conversations with your candidates can really start, you can, you can move your questions to an open-ended format that has your candidate describe and explain scenarios where they actually talk about just that. And then you can hear it. Are they or have they, have they successfully in the past done what we're looking for this individual to do? Because that's really what you're looking for, right? Does this person have the skill sets? Not only them, okay, so yes, they hit A, B, and C as the must-haves, right? This, mm -hmm. In order to do the job, we want them to have these certain qualifications, fine. But it's the after that that most companies fall a little bit short. They, they're not thinking about how this person's going to interact with the others that they're going to be dealing with on a daily basis. And when you can really start thinking about that people-focused approach and start thinking about who makes up our team, what kind of personality types are going to match them, move them, um, encourage them, support them, et cetera, then all of a sudden you've got more of a, a – that's kind of what we see as the trick. That's what makes the magic happen uh, once you get the person up and running. Uh, through, you know, once they're beyond just the how do we do the job, now how let's move the company forward. You touched on a really interesting point there. And, and I think a lot of companies are, are crap at it. I think they, all they do is focus on, on the skill set. Uh, does the person have the qualifications to adequately do the job? Do they? Do they check these boxes? Do they, have they done the exact job before that we're looking to do? And they just look for the person that has the most ability to be successful immediately in the job that they need them to do. Mm -hmm. And they're matching resumes to job descriptions. And if that's all they're doing, if that's all they're focusing on, if that's all that the interview is about is, have you done the job? Can you do the job? Will you be successful at the job? You're missing so much opportunity to talk with people who might not have done the exact job, but have the bare minimum requirements to be um, competent at the job, but then they don't dig into everything else that's not on a resume, that's not on a job description, that's not a skill set. Mm -hmm. What have you seen some of the best companies do to be able to focus on the things that we're just talking about, the ability to help a company be better than it already is versus somebody's ability to perform a task? Sure. I think, you know, one of the, the missed opportunities in an interview is how does someone drive their personal goals? If you start asking people how they drive their personal goals, what goals have they set for themselves personally, not work-related, just in your life? What have you set for yourself recently and how did you get there? What, what have you done to get there? Or how long have you been working on it? Or, you know, those types of questions, open-ended questions, I think paint a lot, they paint a picture on who and what this person does when no one's watching. Those individual goals that people set for themselves are easy to give up on, right? And, and easy to kind of just walk away from or get distracted or, you know, life happens and, you know, all kinds of craziness gets thrown our way every day. But those who are hitting their personal goals, they've got the right formula and they understand what it takes when no one's watching, how to get things done. And that right there is a really good clients are diving into that. And they may not even know that they're doing it, but they're just asking and they're paying attention to what the person says are their hobbies and what are some things that they're accomplishing within, with their family or whatever it is. They're talking about just general, like, hey, you've got goals that you set for yourself personally. Tell me about those. What's the most recent role that you've, uh, goal you've set? And how long did it take you to accomplish it? Have you accomplished it yet? What, what, have, what have been some things that have gotten in your way? And I think the answer to that is often telling to who this person is going to be to get the job done or not get the job done once they actually start with your company. Mm -hmm. And 
so that's one thing you, you asked about what my clients are doing to kind of dive in a little bit deeper and find out who's that fit beyond just the qualifications. And I would say it's just that, you know, they're, they're asking deeper questions beyond just the must haves. The other thing I would say, and, and I know you and Tra you and I, Travis have talked about this in the past, but I often challenge, are those must haves really must haves? If you really look at your must haves as a company and think about, okay, is this a must have is it, or is this trainable? Is this trainable? Is this coachable? Can we dive into this as a company and spend some time when somebody gets onboarded to teach them our way of doing this? Fill in the blank. If, I, if that, the answer is yes. If I could teach somebody this, then really is that a must have? Because the moment you take that must have off the list, your talent pool gets significantly larger. And if your talent pool is getting larger, now all of a sudden you have more individuals that you can choose for from that maybe match that cultural fit or that complement of a culture that you're looking for. And I would challenge that that's actually harder to find. And that's a company really knowing who they are and knowing what they aren't and understanding how and what they're looking for when they think about that complement. Uh, if you really have a good definition of who and what you are as a company and what you need, you're going to have a lot clearer understanding when you're talking to somebody on whether or not they're going to come in and they're going to actually fit well. And I, and I think that that's often true if you were to flip that. Thinking about yourself as a candidate, when you're talking to companies, I hope that you've spent some time before you s took that phone call or took that video call or face-to-face -face meeting to really dive into who you are and what you want. Sometimes people just jump on a call and say, all right, I'm going to talk about my qualifications and I'm going to talk about whether or not I'm a fit for this role or not. Well, that's great, but you're not really, you're missing an opportunity to, to really find out what you are looking for, who and what you need to complement yourself. And if you have a really good, you've taken the time up front to dive into who you are and what you want, I believe, and I have seen, you as a candidate are going to be able to demand more. And I say that in a nice way, but you're going to be able to ensure that you're getting what you want from the beginning versus trying to figure it out after the fact. Because I may like a lot of people, but I'm not going to marry everybody, <laughs> right? I'm going to marry the person that actually compliments me well. But if I don't know who I am, there's a lot of room for error. And that's when you get put with the wrong person, et cetera. But the better you know yourself, the better chance you have of finding that right compliment for you in your future and, and for your next opportunity. So I want to dig into this a little bit because it's, it's still so hard. And sure, we, I'd love to get more companies in the mindset to hire what you can't train. Look for those, really focus on the soft skills. But it's so, so damn hard, Denise, when candidates aren't getting interviews because they don't have the hard skills. How, what can candidates do to go out there and identify the companies whose, whose vision they can get passionate about? They can ex get excited about building the future of that organization. And how can they set themselves apart from candidates who have similar skill sets or even better resumes? How does, how does somebody land that first step in the process so they have the ability to, to sell their ability? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great question. So let's think about the unchangeables, at mm -hmm. least right now, right? So some of the unchangeables are there are processes in place and there are filters in place that certain companies, especially the larger your company, that are in place that are going to weed you out. And that's just a fact, right? So there are ways to help kind of increase your odds that you're going to be spoken to, et cetera. But one of the things that I think, and this is not me making this up, this is just, you hear it all the time. You have to lean on your network. You have to be able to utilize your network, the people you know, the people who care, um, and try to get them to be your cheerleader, to be your ambassador. They, especially if they've worked with you, if they've worked with you, they understand who you are and the type of 
employee you are, the type of work ethic you have, and that speaks a lot of volume. And anytime somebody has shared with me, hey, Denise, you need to talk to this individual. I worked for them for 10 years. I still keep in touch with them now. They have, they, the person's a maniac. They are always doing this. They're always doing this. They, um, you know, they never miss a deadline. They never do that. You know, all these, those soft skills that you can't necessarily find out in a, in a hour conversation with someone on the phone, that holds ton, a ton of weight. And I'm, I'm definitely going to be getting on the phone with that individual. And if I can relay that same message when talking to a client of mine, you better believe they're going to talk to that individual. So I think an underutilized resource is your network. But here's the thing. Your network does, they want to help, but they don't know how to help. So sometimes being able to be very specific with your network is the key to helping them help you. So identifying key companies, again, going back to the self-reflection. So I've assessed myself. I know what I want. I know what I don't like. I know what I'm looking for. I know the type of company and, and the forward thinking mentality that I'm looking for within an organization. I know it. And then I'm going to start sharing that information with my network. And more specifically, when I start hunting down companies that have similar philosophy, I'm going to start sharing with my company, or I'm sorry, with my network, hey, this is the company I'm looking for. Who knows somebody that works there? Now, this, this is a, sounds silly, but that's much different than saying, hey, if you run across a job that might fit me, let me know. Mm -hmm. It's very specific. You're giving your network tools to say, hey, do you know anybody that works at company ABC? I've done some research. I know that they match who I am and what I'm looking for in my next opportunity. And I'd love the opportunity to meet with them or whatever. That type of now, all of a sudden your network is thinking, hmm, I don't know anybody, but doesn't my cousin's sister who's next door neighbor work for the CEO of that company? And now your network is working for you. And you have specific, tangible things that you've given your network that says, go get it. And I have, I've used this. I've tried this on my own side of things. And it absolutely works. Your network is going to be able to say, yep, here's a person, a contact person. And that person may or may not be able to help you, but they may hopefully be able to get you in touch with the person who can. And you just increased your odds significantly of getting on the phone with that company. And they may not even have a role open for you yet, but I'll tell you, really good companies, don't let that stop them. A growing company that's forward thinking, if they meet the right person, they'll make a role for you. Or they will be putting you on their bench strength, right? Putting you on the bench saying, the moment this opens, you better believe we're going to be giving you a call. And it's mm -hmm. interesting to me how quickly that happens after those conversations have been had. What can, what can, I don't even want to call them candidates at this point. What can people do now long before they start looking for a new position uh, long before there is the need to look for a new job? What can they be doing now? What should they be doing now to set themselves up for the best possible shot at landing those, those positions that they can get excited about when the need does arise? Sure. Well, so first, that self-reflection is definitely important. Do you know who, what, where, what you like, what you don't like, right? Uh, we use an exercise called CLAMPS that focuses on the challenge, the location, the advancement, the money, the people, security, and can you rank those six things, right? And do you know what order those are for you, okay? That's, that's an easy way to start. The second thing is you want to be able to, let's look at your resume, right? If you have a really bad resume, and this is, that's your ticket sometimes to get in the door for companies. If your resume isn't talking about results, to me, from a recruiter standpoint, that tells me that you are getting through your job, but you're not intimately aware of the what drives the business. And if you want to impress an owner, uh, a CEO, a COO, if you want to impact somebody who's a decision maker, who is responsible for a PL, you should be talking about how you drive results. So if you're in operations and you aren't putting numbers, percentages on things that you've improved, increased, decreased, you're missing out. If you're in sales, 
my goodness, if you're in sales and you don't have percentages, numbers, how you're improving, kicking butt, taking names, you are, you're really in customer service, right? Mm -hmm. But even if you're in customer service, if you're not saying the percentage of things that you've improved, the things that you've actually um, made changes to, the things that you've implemented, and the, you can tie numbers to everything. And while you may not be a numbers person and, and you just don't think that way, I get it. Most of us are not math people, but numbers talk. And numbers tell your future employer that you understand that there's a point to your job and that your ability to drive results is important to you. Um, and this goes back to like when you're setting your own goals, if you're setting your own goals um, as a person, that your results are really clear on your resume because that gives future employers a indication of what you deem as important and that you're on the same page with them on what's important. How important is a person's LinkedIn profile and social presence to uh, getting the job and finding the job that they want? Well, I think LinkedIn is a great way to be found. So if you want to dip your toe in the water, you're marginally unhappy where you're at, you want to know what's out there, what's possible, you know, you think that you could be a further advanced within your career, then I think that you absolutely should be making yourself more searchable in a, in a format like LinkedIn. And it could be any other format or other um, social media platforms, but you definitely should be putting yourself out there. Um, a great professional picture is a good place to start, right? Allowing people to see who you are. It's kind of like shaking people's hands in a uh, if you were to go to a trade show, right? All of a sudden they see who you are. It's, it's just more personal and they're much more likely to connect you with being a human for one uh, and, and real. So that's important. Um, LinkedIn has, in, has, has made the formatting of resumes un, universal, right? So when you look at a LinkedIn profile, it now resembles what a resume looks like. In fact, resumes are now looking more like LinkedIn profiles. And the reason for that is people like that consistency. They like to know where to find things. So if you can look, make your LinkedIn profile look more like a resume, again, you're going to be more searchable. And that's what's going to allow future employers or people like myself to find you uh, for specific roles that we're working on. Uh, and then, you know, I think just cleaning up your profile, right? I mean, this is not Facebook. Uh, I think that, you know, having political viewpoints or, you know, show your, showing yourself partying or whatever, that's not appropriate, right? You want to be able to show yourself in a professional manner. Uh, assume that all of your future employers will be looking for you in social medias, regardless of what that is. So even in your TikTok video, you know, it should be professional. <laughs> professional as that can be if that's what you're going to do. Well, I think LinkedIn has had a, had a nice shift over the years um, where it used to be a place for people to you know, basically have their resume updated in real time and be found by recruiters. But more and more, I think more and more people are using it to sell, not sell, showcase their services and the value that they can bring, not only to employers and to, and to potential companies, but also to potential customers. And I think that's one of the exciting things about LinkedIn is making it more engaging is that because so much of it has become about generate, creating value for your potential customers, if you're doing that now and doing it consistently, then if and when you need to start to look for work, your potential, your potential employers already know who you are. They know the value you have, the ability to provide to their customers, then you're so far ahead of the game than people who just have a plain old resume. And P.S., if anybody um, listening to this wants some help with their LinkedIn, track me down, send me a DM. I've got some, some good info. I'd be happy to send you over to help you gussy it up a little bit. So uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, the industry you specialize in. You've been working in the food and beverage industry, uh, recruiting in it for about six years now, just over five years, incredible, um, and been incredibly successful at it. What do you see as the 
the current state of the industry and, and what does the future hold? So food and beverage manufacturing is definitely growing. People are continuing to eat as anything, right? The what people are eating and the how they're eating it is shifting. Um, and some of that is not by choice. It's just kind of what our world and our post, you know, pre or now that we're in COVID dealing with this, um, you know, that definitely has impacted it. And, and this is with anything with food. Food is constantly evolving. And so companies who are more able to pivot and be able to be flexible, diversifying who and what they provide and how they provide it, uh, just have much more of a, a consistent track record and success. So what I'm seeing from a recruiter standpoint in the food and beverage manufacturing space is an increased need in quality and operations individuals, which makes a lot of sense. Quality, well, there's a, a lot more qual uh, regulations, rules and regulations that are put into place, and consumers are demanding it, demanding that their food and their beverages be safe, have specific quality. They want things to be more visible for them. And so that absolutely impacts my manufacturers because now they need to make sure that they have qualified individuals who can accurately go after and document and label things appropriately, right? And, and are constantly staying up to speed with the evolving quality expectations and requirements. Mm -hmm. You can't have somebody who just wants to, you know, show up to work, punch in and punch out. This person has to be, or these people, all have to kind of be staying up to speed with the ever-changing environment that we live in. Um, the operation side of things, okay, well, now you've got an increased demand uh, in a lot of cases of products, and, but, you, but you can't increase your space. And most people right now are not wanting to purchase or expand upon the real estate that they have because the reality is it's so up in the air. That's scary for a lot of companies. And, and who wants to throw that kind of capital down? So how do we make more with what we have? So operations and operational roles is absolutely an increase in demand that I'm seeing on my desk. And I know my colleagues are as well because companies are saying, all right, if we can find somebody who can zone in on operational efficiencies and improving OEE and, and improving just what we're capable of making um, that look for those low-hanging fruits, uh, is our process working the best way it possibly could, that's going to ultimately increase what we're actually able to produce reduce our overall cost, right? Um, increase our revenue. I mean, all the good things that, that most of my hiring authorities look for, or my, you know, the people that are running these companies want to hear. So one of the changes that I'm, or two of the changes that I'm seeing within the food and beverage manufacturing space that I see sticking around is an increased demand for really solid quality people who can showcase that they have this consistent growth mentality and want to constantly be challenging who they are and what they're learning, et cetera. And then on the same thing, same thing for operations. Somebody who really just loves and is passionate about finding what's missing, right? Looking for what's not going right or what could be better. If you're hungry like that, that's what these companies are going to be looking for and are looking for currently. Hmm. So what can, what can a, a person do, a candidate do to set themselves apart Right now, in this current time, what can they do to make sure they're putting their best face forward? Sure. I think, you know, how can, if I, if I were to encourage candidates who are looking right now, let's say you don't have a job, COVID hit you, you don't have a job, you're looking. One thing that can make you stick out is what are you doing? What are you reading? What are you paying attention to? Which companies are you following to stay relevant? I think often candidates, when they're in the interview process, feel that they can only count on the stuff that they've done, which is fine. That's important. And like I said, your resume should showcase the results that you were able to accomplish within your company, which, by the way, is easier to write down when you're in it verse after the fact, but right. So that's a little side note, but one thing to think about is, okay, so you're no longer with your company. 
if you know where you're going and what type of company you're looking for, are you paying attention to the trends? Are you paying attention to what other, what their competition is doing? Um, because I'll tell you what, most people who go into an interview aren't talking about what they're reading about the competition. They aren't talking about things that they noticed about, you know, I've been following your company for a little while and I've noticed that your marketing is putting out posts about blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm noticing that, you know, your competitor posts significantly more than your company posts. But whatever it is, if you're highlighting real things that are happening in a social media platform or things that you're reading about articles within that space, um, that is absolutely going to put you uh, ahead of, of of the curve. The other thing is just looking at their website. If you're diving into their website and you're jotting down questions, you're connecting the dots. Even if your assessment isn't spot on, even if it's a little, like there's a, a little bit of an error in there, the fact that you went through that exercise is huge. And it puts you above what most people come to the table with, which is here I am, like, don't you want to hire me? Like, no, why do I want to hire you? What about your personality? What about your way that you approach interacting with a company separates you from your peers? Well, I'm going to show you because I looked on your website. This is some things that I found. I'm following your competitors. Here's some things that I'm noticing, right? Just showing that you went above and beyond what the normal expectations are, which is answering questions. It's so important. And I'm, I'm amazed at how few people come in with an answer to that. Uh, I'll, all the candidates listening, I'll let you in on a secret. One of the most important questions and really the most objective question that a hiring authority can ask you during the interview process is, what do you know about us? Because you can't BS it. You have to have done your homework. You have to have shown the, the initiative, the excitement, the energy, the passion to go out and do some work before the interview to come prepared with knowledge about the company the person or people you're going to be talking to and to have questions based on the knowledge that you gained. And so many people come in and say, um, well, I mean, you're, you're, you're a recruiting company and uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in being a recruiter. Right. All right. Uh, I guess you don't want to really want to be recruited that bad if you couldn't you know, take 10 minutes to find out anything about us beforehand. So right. and it doesn't um, take long. It no. really doesn't take long. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And they should start doing it now. I, I really, I really think that no matter how much you love your company, no matter how much you love your job, who knows what that company or that job is going to look like six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now. Now is the time to be learning and engaging with the, the companies that you could get excited about doing your best work for. So, uh, last thing I want to talk about, Denise, you just had your five-year anniversary at Miller Resource Group. You've been wildly, wildly successful there. Tell me a little bit about um, your experience there, what that's been like, and um, what have, what do you think has uh, attributed to your high level of success? Well, I think that Miller, first of all, Miller Resource Group is a company that is really focused on their people. And I think that's really important. When you feel that you're cared for, when you feel like the, the owners that you work for really are passionate about you and, and want to see you succeed, I think that that sets up a, a great recipe for success. Mm -hmm. You're given the opportunity, I definitely was given the opportunity to kind of run with things that are my strengths. And, you know, being given the support, the encouragement, the resources. You know, anytime I've asked, hey, Gary, Travis, can I speak with some successful people in other offices? You got it. Hey, can I get training on this or this? No problem. Um, being able to be given that support is unparalleled. And I think that that has absolutely helped with my success. I mean, I think just having fabulous leadership. Um, and then I think, you know, it helps that our group is supported um, with other fabulous individuals that make it fun. Uh, I think it's, I hear it all the time from other candidates that I speak to, if you're not having fun where you work, um, that gets pretty boring. Uh, so it's, 
nice to be able to just support each other and be able to laugh with each other, uh, encourage each other, even when things aren't necessarily working out right. Um, I think that that helps as well. So, you know, being a part of an amazing team, I think that Miller Resource Group, when they hired me on, and when they hire on other individuals, take a lot of time to think about how this person will complement who we are as a company. We talked about that earlier, but they talked, they thought about how this person will complement the group. And I think that that has encouraged some really different people and personalities and ways of going about things, which just makes me better every day. And it makes the way I look at things different. It challenges what I think is possible. And I think that encourages me to be better and want to do better every day. That's fantastic. Uh, Denise, thanks so much for taking the time to, to chat with me here today. Uh, if people want to track you down, if they want to get in, in touch with you, what's the best way for them to find you? I would drop me an email at deniec at millerresource.com. Uh, that's usually the best place. LinkedIn, I'm all over LinkedIn. So I would love to, to introduce myself to you, have you introduce yourself to me. And uh, yeah, look forward to communicating with all of you. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Denise. And thanks so much for listening today. Really appreciate it. Uh, please subscribe and follow this show uh, to make sure to catch all future episodes. And if you like my silly questions and you liked hearing Denise talk, please uh, leave us a review and, and rate this podcast. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. I'm making a move. So I